Good morning. Let's stand, please. And we're going to sing Victory in Jesus. Right music. 
Good here. This is the final lesson today in um, our Builders Building <coughs> Series. And I um, hope that you've gotten a little bit out of that. For me, it's the, the bottom line has been the same. And that is, is that uh, God's the master builder, so whatever he's building, whatever he's doing, he's doing because he's a master builder. And if that's an actual construction, and some, some are so literal, I've had somebody ask me about where he was building these things I'm talking about, and I said, well, I'm being built. I'm in, you know, I'm under construction right now. So the terms are used throughout Scripture, just like we use them also in our own lives as well for uh, opportunity to change, to build, reconstruct, put back together, tear down, remodel, re you know, all the things that we do uh, also have spiritual implications. So last week we talked about the term rebuilding and understanding that by grace we are fully restored to the original blueprint. <clears throat> That seldom happens in, when we're rebuilding something in our house or there's damage. We get it pretty close and sometimes we, we do very well. It helps if we have something that we can gauge that by. And that gauging is uh, the Word of God for spiritual life. But we also said that any attempt to rebuild what God tore down is a bad plan. Remember in the story, that what we read last week, Paul was confronting Peter because Peter was, when he was with one group of people, he acted one way. And when he was with another group of people, he acted a different way. When he was with the Jews, he acted Jewish and he talked Jewish things. When he was with the Gentiles, he talked like the Gentiles talked and he acted like the Gentiles talked. And uh, Paul said, hey, get over this. You got, you've, it's one message for all. So Jew or Gentile, and that's everybody in the world as far as scripture is concerned, uh, same message. So don't you need to communicate clearly. And the idea of tearing down was is that God took the old person and built, a new, built something new. as a new creation. So don't be going back to your old ways. You know, well, I can go back. I'll visit these other things. The greatest thing that we can do is, as a child of God, live like we're the new creation we are and begin life and living that life. Uh, go back and say, well, I don't like that. I'm going to go back and live it my way. Um, it's not how God planned it. Finally today, there's another kind of building, and it's something we see, and we use the term. Even politicians use this term. But building a nation. So the United States of America, we celebrated our 4th uh, of July yesterday, the, the date that the... Uh, the Declaration of Independence was signed that it may note that we are a separate nation among nations in the world. It makes us unique. But all nations, for the most part, had a similar day. There's a day that they became a nation. They may be a group of people who had a home and then now have a home. And even this is a, uh, an interesting thing to bring up about us. We're a rel relatively new nation. Uh, there are nations that have, you know, houses older than our country is, and by far thousands of years. But what is used today? An example from one that's well known. The background picture that you see behind us today is uh, Jerusalem, and a uh, nation among nations is Israel. And you look at it, and the area that uh, this encompasses it is uh, part of the old Tr Jerusalem. The gold dome that's, a, that's setting in the picture is not the temple of God. This in fact was built uh, in the, uh, I believe around the 1200. Um, it's, an actual, it's a Muslim temple built over uh, a particular stone that the prophet Mohammed is said to have ascended by. And yet the walls below this are the original temple mound walls and bricks. That wall in the different parts of it, parts of what's called the Wailing Wall, or parts of that, 
in the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by walls. It's right down here at the very heart, you can see a, a, a highway. And the walls of the city of Jerusalem, these walls that existed uh, in ancient times, still pretty well exist around the old ancient part of Jerusalem. One of these days, where those trees are in the middle of the picture, there's going to be a temple rebuilt and uh, it's prophesied and all the materials ready, close to being ready, to build that in a moment's notice. But there will be a day on that mound the temple of God will again set. What did it take to build a nation, not just Jerusalem, but the nation of Israel? So we have to look at a little historical information and we can launch out uh, a little bit in our study this morning. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7 says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy family, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. There's the foundational beginning of the nation we know as Israel. Let us give to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. Help us know as we go forth and into the world around us and understand how important it is we serve in you in every avenue of life, from our very private home life to uh, the public life, to the cities and nations that we uh, dwell in. And this morning that we say we are, uh, it is great to be an American, to be a part of this great country whose heritage is, is great. Uh, while not perfect, it is a nation that has from the beginning sought to be uh, aligned with you. God is now in the study of what we ask you to your sins today. Amen. So, this is, there's a man by the name of Abram, later called Abraham, and he lived in a place called Ur, you are, the Chaldees, and it's uh, not far from ancient Babylon. He was an idol worshiper, he was uh, a pagan man, did not worship the God of heaven, but the God of heaven came to him one day and said, Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land I will show you. And this is an amazing story. While compacted into one point, we have the beginning of a nation that was already being formed by this time, but yet didn't have its organizational documents in hand. And God called this man, and... Uh, of course, I have all sorts of things in my mind. Did he ask back? Did he say, uh, who's this I'm talking to? Uh, all the things. We just see God talking to him. And the next thing we know, and we know it's still true, because there still is a nation called Israel in our world. This is the remainder of that. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now this is my other question. Lord, could you have called me at a... Why can't you have done this when I was 30? You waited until I was 75 years old to make a, a desert trip across everything to go everywhere I need to go? Somehow, I think at 75, he's probably in better shape than I am at 65 today. And, uh, you know, this isn't when uh, everybody's living to be thousands of years old, but if you know the story, they're going to have a kid. They're going to have a child at 100. Well, you know, and so different times. And for, of course, God's involved. Abraham took Sarah's wife and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in here, and they went forth to the land of Canaan, and to the land of Canaan they came. And they were passed through the land to the land of uh, Sashem, to the land of Morah, and the 
Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, And to thy seed will I give this land, and there building me an altar to the Lord who appeared unto him. So there's the story. We've got kids, family, they loaded up the old car and moved, uh, not quite like Beverly Hill Village, but they moved on, they took all their cattle, and took everything. They packed it all up and began a march. And they came into the land that is currently occupied by the nation of Israel, also occupied in part by the nation of Jordan, also occupied in part by the nation of Syria. But all that land was given originally to Abraham and to the Jewish people as a homeland, as to be the nation of Israel. They do not occupy those borders today. One day they will return to those borders. And I know all the dispute, we hear it in our news, and we hear a nation, and we hear, uh, you know, they can be critical of uh, news and fake news and all those sorts of things, but very little is seen in a positive light of Israel today who uh, deserves to go back to their homeland. The descendants of Abraham, the history of Abraham, begins uh, with Abraham, you know, 2000 BC. Israel itself is a term that means prevailing or even wrestling with God uh, as a prince would. So it's, uh, there's a lot in that name, but the E-L at the end is God. When you look at the Hebrew language and it's translated into English, anytime you see the letter E-L, you know that it's talking about Yahweh. You know it's talking about the God of heaven, the eternal existent God. Always has been, always will be. No beginning, no end. It is God among the gods of the world. He's the only real God. And that's why that E-L. And so that part lets us know that whatever is being said before has to do with God. Uh, there's a story, we will not read it today, but at uh, Jack, Genesis chapter 32, verse 28, there was a little wrestling went on there. And uh, there was a wrestling match that ended up with uh, Jacob and God wrestling in uh, his remorse to the story. But, you know, it didn't beat God. But what he did was stand up and show his strength among uh, the people and show his fortitude, I think, for God to see and test his nature. And from this point, the descendants of Abraham through Jacob are referred to as the children of Israel. So that they are still that today. Israel is a small nation. Uh, they are not large, even among people today. In fact, more Jewish people by uh, birth are in the United States than live in the homeland of Israel, the country of Israel. More live in New York City than live in that entire country. So the Jewish population of our United States, of course, is very interested in how we treat Israel. And we have been a blessed nation. And uh, did we not read just a few moments ago that God has said, if you'll be a blessing to my people, I'll bless you. But if you curse my people, uh, I'll curse you. Our country's been blessed in times past and has been blessed to this day by being a blessing to Israel. But our nation is changing and our, our sympathies are changing. Uh, I fear for us the day that our country takes a stand or does something in, in some way hurts the Jewish people. There's no logical explanation for uh, God to use them, but he does that on an undeserved level. In fact, that shows grace. That's the same thing with us. We're saved by grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We don't do good things to get it. It's God says, here's grace. I'm, I'm willing to give you uh, eternal life. You just ask for it and take it by faith. And that's kind of what happened with Israel. They didn't ask to be his country. And uh, of all the nations of the world, why he choose? He just chose them out of his sovereignty because he wanted to. And that's them. He could have used the Irish people. He could have used anybody. But he chose 
those of the lineage that uh, he did. Uh, Abraham is the sentence of chosen for special service, not special privilege. Sometimes that's confused. It's confused that the Bible shows this happens to them. That as God's people, they go, well, we're God's people, so then we don't have to do uh, anything. We just go to heaven because we're good. We're, we're Jews. And that's, of course, not the truth. You have to receive them by faith. That has always been the plan of salvation. Never, ever has anybody gone to heaven because they earned their way there. They go because God's grace is, is permitted and they accept Him in faith. And uh, it was God's plan from the beginning to use Israel for that as the instrument through which the Messiah would come and bring salvation to us all. You and I are referred to as Abraham's family by faith. We're related to him. Uh, not genetically, but by faith, spiritually. And you can be thankful for that because they are the people to which this messenger came, which allowed him to be born into this world. It begins with one. Of course, at first it wasn't the Jews. It was one man, and we've already read his story, Abraham. And uh, he's famous not only among the Jewish people, but among uh, the, those we would call today the Ishmaelites, who tend to be mostly the Muslim countries of the world today. But the Middle Eastern Arabic tribes are related to Abraham as well. In fact, there's stepbrothers that are related in this. Same uh, father, different mothers. And uh, I remember this. This is another thing I remember from our from my trip back in 1992 uh, to uh, Israel. Was our tour guide one tour guide and two. Two guys, bus driver was really the other one, but he drove, and he was Arabic, and our tour guide was Jewish. And they would speak to each other, and we would not have any idea what they're talking about, they're speaking Hebrew. And then they would laugh, and then we'd say, Well, what are you talking about? He says, Oh, we're just two two stepbrothers arguing like we always do, and playing that out on national TV, he says, You see it all around. They just can't quite get along. And it began with this same patriarch, Abraham. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 through 8, it says, Thou art the Lord the God who didst choose Abram and brought him out forth out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and gave him the name Abraham, and foundest his heart faithful before thee, and made us to come in with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites and Jebusites and Gerbersites to give it, I say, to his seed, and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous. So God said, come out, and Abraham did that. And you might ask, so yeah, he was faithful to follow what God said to do, but did he really, what did he see in him? When it was, his name was changed to describe how he would be this father of great nations. And uh, so expanded his name a little bit. And yet when we see all that, we go, so what's the big deal? Why Abraham? And uh, Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2 says, It came to pass after these things that God had tempted Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountains, which I will tell thee of. A couple of things there. One of the reasons Abraham is used of God is because uh, he was available. He said, Behold, here I am. So he acknowledged that I am I'm part. Now, he'd already known him by this, this point, and this is that opportunity that God said to uh, uh, not tempting him and testing him beyond to prove him, but to show 
I think it's going to show us a little bit. There's a verse that's tied to this that we need to read. We'll do so in just a few moments. But that the idea of, of Abraham following God required faith in him. And how much faith would you have to have in order for God to tell you, take your only son and take him out there on an altar and sacrifice him? Now, I, I speak as a father. I cannot even comprehend what I would do if God asked me to do that. Am I strong enough? Is my faith strong enough? Is my life strong enough? When God says to make a sacrifice, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with it in what little sacrifice I make in my life today for God. I struggle with it. You know, oh, my time's it's in, I'm inconvenienced a little bit. Abraham's asked to take his son of the mountains of Moriah, which is the area that today we just showed you a picture of, the area of uh, sacrifice for God's people. What? And that old top of a threshing floor back before there was a city built on top of that hill, uh, an altar was built. And you know the story. Uh, he was ready to do it. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and Sabbath his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. He got up, told the wife, see you later. Got the wood, took the son. Not knowing for sure how this day went in, but yet he did that. This is the type of man that God called to build a nation on. The nations of wonderful nations, the mighty nation, no little in number, the mighty in faith. And part of it is because look at the patriarch it's built on. What a wonderful man. Hard to follow. Hard of, of discipline to do uh, these things for God. Abraham, by faith, trusted in God. God had faith in Abraham. God didn't make a mistake by using Abraham. It's a mistake to think that Abraham was sinless or perfect, because he's not. And the story of Abraham shows some faults. He had a beautiful wife, and he was afraid that uh, she would be misused, and he lied about it. And about her. God said, you're going to have a kid. He and his wife both laughed. Uh, <laughs> sure. God very specifically said, is anything too hard for God? If I want you to have a child, you'll have a child. God can do anything he wants, anytime he wants. There's a drought. God says it'll rain, and the drought's over. You can have a child when you think you told you could. You can. God changes the world at His will and has in the past. It begins with one, and Abraham had faith. Demonstrated it by following after God. And this is the story of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report. In faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Faith is not saying I'm going to step out of faith because I can see how this is going to end. You and I have a little bit more of that than our forefathers because we have the Word of God. I can read about it. I can read about where I'm going by my faith. I know I'm going to go to heaven because I have trusted in the Lord with my soul. What if I weren't given a Bible? I'm just told to go and serve this God. Abraham did that and fulfilled that job and God had faith in Abraham and made a covenant, a covenant of promise. 
We have a church covenant on our wall here. Maybe some, some people ask, why is that? Almost verbatim, that same covenant is in, in most Baptist churches and a lot of other evangelical churches. But it's our promise. When you join this church, these are the things we choose to promise together. We made a covenant. You promised. Uh, did I promise anything? You promised. You promised before God that as a church member, you would be uh, in covenant with what we choose as a agreement. The ultimate covenant is to say, when you join this church, you agree to follow these scriptures. You agree to be a part of this church. You agree to be a member of this church. You agree to be involved in this church. Attend this church. Promote the, the growth and well-being of this church. To give your tithes and offerings to this church. To do all you can for this to be a representative of, of the kingdom of God in this place. So don't take it lightly. You promised. Guess who else is promised? Israel. The signator was Abraham. God made a promise through Abraham. And he's still holding the Jewish people accountable for that today. They're still the covenant people of God. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. He left not knowing where he was going. I told Karen, we uh, were in Portland uh, Thursday afternoon, and we were had gone to one place, and we were going to go over to uh, Ikea by the airport. And that was a bad decision, partly because from where we were to get over there uh, it takes a long time. Everything in Portland takes a long time for somebody who lives in a little town like me, right? So I told Karen, well, I've heard this before, I don't know where we're going, but we're making good time. So we were traveling around, we covered a lot of ground, but we never did really arrive at our destination until later. We had to get help to get back on track. That's Abraham. Where are we going, Abraham? Lot's going. Uncle Abraham, where are we going? Sarah's going, where are we going? All the servants, where are we going? Day after day after day, and, and Abraham's going, I don't have a clue. You just wait. We'll find out pretty soon. And day to day, mile to mile, when he needed to know God let him know. But he didn't really know. On the day he left, he didn't have a map. He just had God. That's faith. By faith, he sowed you in the land of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I don't know where we're going, kids, but when we get there, it's built by God. In the back of his mind, literally he must have been thinking, we're going to a place God built. Man, it's going to be a wonderful place because you know who built it? God built it. So he's telling Isaac and Jacob, it's going to be a wonderful place. It's great because... God's there. God built it. So we know that he looked for a city. Actually, really what that means is that God desired what God, Abraham desired what God desired. Abraham, go to the place I want you to go. And Abraham says, if I go to the place that he wants me to go, God's there. That's what I know. God's directions will make you, never take you where His grace won't keep you. It'll be okay. Well, I don't know how long I'm going to make it. I don't know. Isn't it a wonderful thing to say, I don't know how this is all going to end up? Because 
to a certain extent, you and I are Abraham's. He has called us in life, yet we are imperfect in our ability to foretell the future. I can't even get across Portland to see Ikea. You think that I know what's going to happen tomorrow in my life, or next week, or next year, or 20 years from now? I don't have the foggiest idea. My job is to stay in the spiritual car and let God take me where I'm going. I know the ultimate result. That's a city. I am waiting for a city that God has built as the foundation. I'm waiting for a day when I walk down the streets of gold down New Jerusalem. And y'all walking down there with me. And we're looking at the, the wonderful city. The waters flowing and trees by the... It's a wonderful day. Once we get there. But the journey is right now. But I'm looking for a city. So is Abraham. Now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham when he was tried offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And a lot of people discuss this point. Well, he knew that God would rescue him before he hurt Isaac. This verse tells me that that's not true. This verse tells me that Abraham knew that if he killed Isaac and wanted Isaac to walk, that God would do it. Abraham didn't question God. Abraham knew what God's capable of doing. God says, kill my son, offer my son, I'll do it. He offered him a promise. Surely he will not break his promise to my son. God doesn't lie about promises. And so he knew the moment Isaac quit breathing that God could stand him right back up as if he'd never been hurt. That, my friends, is faith. That's what made Abraham special. That's what makes the nation of Israel a special nation. It's built on the shoulders of an exceptional man. And that man really is just like one of us. Abraham had faith. Abraham looked for a city. And Abraham moved when he was told to move. He believed. He looked for what God had in store for him. And while he was doing that, he was riding the camel all on the way to Canaan. Didn't know for sure where he's going, but looking for God when he got there. You might say, well, this is the end of the sermon because you know I'm going to ask this question. So are you the one? Are you the one that's going to change this world. A nation can be built around you. A man that they write about. A woman of character. An example of that is in another individual. Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 6 to 11 says, The Lord therefore hath performed his word that he has spoken. This is Solomon speaking. For I am risen up in the room of David my father and am set on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And in it I have put the ark where it is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the children of Israel. Solomon was a nation builder. Solomon was a builder. What did he build? He built a famous temple. 
David wanted to build it, but God said no. And he said to Solomon, yep, you can build it. And he built. And he built a temple. A wonderful edifice it must have been. One of the things that had that it is said, it was up on the hill. And remember that picture of Jerusalem, the gold dome that shows today a, a Muslim building. Imagine a temple building that would have shined like that for God. And the original temple was coated in gold plating. One of the most wonderful things that people saw in Jerusalem in ancient times was on a sunny day when they came over the Mount of Olives, down through the valley, and they first spotted Jerusalem. It was a magnificent, golden, glowing object that identified the city as the city of God, the temple. Solomon saw it through and its building. What he also presents in this section of scripture is that Solomon presents God's nation building outline. Want to build a nation? Here's how you do it. So, 2 Chronicles 7.14, a lot of us can quote that probably by Memory, it's been used a lot. July 4th, we ought to read this in our homes. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You got problems in your land? Even Solomon had problems in the land. David had problems. Great King David had problems controlling people. Don't you just hate that? I can't even imagine what it must be like to be even the president of this United States. That I don't care what party you are, I don't care what you do and what you accomplish, what you don't accomplish, but you're never ever without your critics. And David was the same. And if you recall the story, you know that he had critics within his own household. His son. You gotta get rid of dad. He's a terrible king. Why? Well, it's my dad, that's one of the problems. He's my dad. How smart can a dad be? A lot of people in the world find that it's hard because they can't imagine a dad because they don't identify with a man that stood up in their life. They don't identify with somebody that makes a difference in their lives. The problem with our dads, you know what the problem is, you live with them. So every single fault they have is right there in your face. And every time they give you the lecture, it all comes out again. No, not the lecture. It's always the lecture. I'm critical of dads right now. Yes, I know. But your mom <laughs> done it too. Mom done it too. Some little simple thing, and you get the story. When I was your age, if everybody would you follow, if that, you know, you got it all. Story pretty much stayed the same for all generations. It gets a little updated in modern times, but it's still the same. The basically is saying, you're my child, and right now you're acting stupid. I said, I, am I stupid? And your child is going, do not ask me that question. You know. 
because right now, stupid is looking at stupid. There's no other term I can think of right now that would use that one. I'm sorry if I offended everybody by using it. But I didn't realize until I was older that my dad was a genius. Most of our moms and dads, their IQ raises as we age. But be it as it may, here is that rendition of it. And but this is not a full story. You've got to read the rest of it. So here we go. We get through the change here. Second Corinthians 7, 15 through 22 says, this is just a continuation from that verse we read. Now my eyes shall be opened and my ears attended to the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. As for thee, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked and do according to all that I have commanded thee and shall observe my statutes and my judgments, Then will I establish the house of thy kingdom, according as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. This is not in yours written this way, it's only on the slide. Bold. But if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I pluck them up by the roots of the, out of my land and will, which I have given them, and this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight. Will I be, will make it to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. So, up through verse 18, this is what's good. You serve me, this is your expectation. But that one infamous thing. But, but if, how'd I be a good nation? How'd I be a great nation? Follow everything up to verse 19 here. And this house which is high shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it. So that he shall say, What hath the Lord done thus unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, Because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold on other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore hath he brought all this evil upon them. Insert United States. Insert England. Insert uh, Mexico. Insert uh, Brazil, insert any nation you want, and that nation is under the same marching orders that God has given here. You want to serve me and follow me, I'll bless you. But if you turn and you serve other gods, I'm going to pluck you out of the world. And when people talk of you, they won't talk of you in a great way. It will be as if what happened to them? They will it. Whatever happened to that thing called the United States of America? This generation that's watching right now, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, the generations that are alive right now are being held accountable to not forsake the Lord God. The warning is before us. Will we allow it to happen? Or will we let the corrupt, the ungodly, those that have no interest in serving God, tell us what our nation will be? It can't be that way. It's God's work, and we should serve it and do it God's way. God built Israel with a faithful man and family. The result of which is in 1948, they reorganized into the modern state of Israel that they are today. And you know, 
that is a wonderful thing. But you can back up from that and say, well, how come they were like they were? Because they forsook God. And he plucked them out of their land. And now he's replaced them to await the end time events of this world. I don't know when the Lord's coming back. I don't know how much time we have. I don't know how it all will play out exactly. But I know that because there is a nation of Israel that the prophecy of the dry bones regathering has happened. That there is a nation today that within the timing of this, it's showing us we're drawing nigh unto our redemption. The moment of our departure is that hand. We are at risk of becoming a byword. It scares me. I love this country. I love its principles. It is not a sinless and it has committed many a wrong. But of the nations of the world today, if I were given a choice, I would stay right where I am. We have done mission work all over the world. Souls have been won. The very principle of our nation, why should there be an America, the United States of America, Whether you agree with how the settling of it took place, I cannot say it is without effort that we came to this land and hurt people in the doing of it. Could, have been, could it have been done differently? I say it probably could have been. But here I am today saying that here we are and the end result is we have this country. What do we do now? Well, the one thing I know is that in reading Scripture, I don't see our name mentioned anywhere. And many areas of the world are mentioned that are contemporary now. Are we a byword? God builds nations. God can also tear them down. He uses people like us. We have a choice. What can one person do? I don't know that I have the perfect answer for you and what you'll be doing or not doing in days to come. But I can say that this is what we have studied over the last few weeks. Whatever you build, you build on God. God's not in it. You shouldn't be associated with it. He builds a nation. He builds it in your home. God builds through the home. Our families. Through your church. How do we use the commission God gave us? Is it all on me? Is it all on you? No, but it's on us. This New Testament church is being held responsible for the souls of people in matters. For Jefferson County. There are bloods on our hands if we don't reach them with the gospel. We need your help. And this is the organization that can do it. We change the community. It's not just about whether or not you like what you can buy in the community or not. Is it modern, not modern? You know, there's some of these things that are the trivial things, you know? One of the things Karen and I kind of like, we're, we like kind of the old downtown areas and like to walk them. And it does my heart good when there's downtowns that are still functional. And they have a reason for you to walk down those streets. It's still living down in the core. Don't get me wrong, I like all those other things too. We like modern things in our communities. 
But the primary thing is change your community for God. And finally, a stewardship for our country. What can one person do? Well, we elect one person to be a president. And he has a lot of influence. But you know what? He works for you. Of all the countries in the world, our president works. We pay him a salary. Our current one doesn't take his salary. He turns it back. Because he's wealthy enough to not take a salary. I admire that. I also know that somebody should keep his phone away from him as far as they can. Sometimes I just can't believe what he says, what he does. But you know what? He's employed by us. He works for us. And so do your representatives, even down to our local ones here. You should know them. You should have them be stewards. Be a steward. Your elected officials are accountable to you, my friend. And our country, then, therefore, is accountable to us. Don't let anybody take it from you. It is a great place. And I would say this if I were in England. I would say this if I were in uh, Afghanistan. Well, that won't work in the Soviet Union. Oh, yes, it will. There's no leader in any place in the whole world that God's not interested in and isn't there because God's allowing them to be there. What are you building? Let's build it together. Let's build this home, this land, this church, this community, this family. Let's build it. Are you ready for that? We'll always stand today. We'll always sing.